Chapter Nine of Babbitt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter Nine. One. Babbitt was fond of his friends. He loved the importance of being host and shouting, "Certainly, you're going to have some more chicken." The idea. And he appreciated the genius of T. Charmolundy Fink. But the vigor of the cocktails was gone, and the more he ate, the less joyful he felt. Then the amity of the dinner was destroyed by the nagging of the Swansons. In Floral Heights and the other prosperous sections of Zenith, especially in the young married set, there were many women who had nothing to do, though they had few servants, yet with gas stoves, electric ranges and dishwashers, and vacuum cleaners, and tiled kitchen walls. Their houses were so convenient that they had little housework, and much of their food came from bakeries and delicatessens. They had but two, one, or no children, and despite the myth that the Great War had made work respectable, their husbands objected to their wasting time and getting a lot of crank ideas in unpaid social work, and still, more to their causing, a rumor by earning money that they were not adequately supported. They worked perhaps two hours a day, and the rest of the time they ate chocolates, went to the motion pictures, went window shopping, went in gossiping twos and threes to card parties, read magazines, thought timorously of the lovers who never appeared, and accumulated a splendid restlessness, which they got rid of by nagging their husbands. The husbands nagged back. Of these naggers, the Swansons were perfect specimens. Throughout the dinner, Eddie Swanson had been complaining publicly about his wife's new frock. It was, he submitted, too short, too low, too immodestly thin, and much too expensive. He appealed to Babbitt. Honest, George, what do you think of that rag Luetta went and bought? Don't you think it's the limit? What's eating you, Eddie? I call it a swell little dress. Oh, it is, Mr. Swanson. It's a sweet frock, Mrs. Babbitt protested. There now, do you see, Smarty? You're such an authority on clothes, Loretta raged, while the guests ruminated and peeped at her shoulders. It's all right now, said Swanson. I'm authority enough, so I know it was a waste of money, and it makes me tired to see you not wearing out a whole closet full of clothes you got already. I've expressed my idea about this before, and you know good and well you don't pay the least bit of attention. I have to camp on your trail to get you to do anything. There was much more of it, and they all assisted, but Babbitt, everything about him was dim except his stomach, and that was a bright scarlet disturbance. Had too much grub, ought to eat all that stuff, he groaned, while he went on eating, while he gulped down a chill and glutinous slice of ice cream brick and coconut cake as oozy as shaving cream. He felt as though he had been stuffed with clay. His body was bursting, his throat was bursting, his brain was hot mud. And only with agony did he continue to smile and shout as became a host of Floral Heights. He would, except for his guests, have fled outdoors and walked off the intoxication of food. But in the haze which filled the room they sat forever, talking, talking, while he agonized. Darn fool to be eating all this! not another mouthful, and discovered that he was again tasting the sickly welter of melted ice cream on his plate. There was no magic in his friends. He was not uplifted. When Howard Littlefield produced from his treasure house of scholarship the information that the chemical symbol for raw rubber is C10H16, which turns into isoprene, which is 2C5H8, suddenly, without precedent, Babbitt was not merely bored, but admitting that he was bored. It was ecstasy to escape from the table, from the torture of a straight chair, and loll on the Davenport in the living room. The others, from their fitful, unconvincing talk, their expressions of being slowly and painfully smothered, seemed to be suffering from the toil of social life and the horror of good food as much as himself. All of them accepted with relief the suggestion of bridge. Babbitt recovered from the feeling of being boiled. He wanted bridge. He was again able to endure Virgil Gunch's inexorable hardiness. 
but he pictured loafing with Paul Reithling beside a lake in Maine. It was as overpowering and imaginative as homesickness. He had never been to Maine, yet he beheld the shrouded mountains of the tranquil lake of evening. "'That boy Paul's worth all these ballahoo and highbrows put together,' he muttered. "'And I'd like to get away from everything.' Even Louetta Swanson did not rouse him. Mrs. Swanson was pretty and plain. Babbitt was not an analyst of women, except as to their taste in furnished houses to rent. He divided them into real ladies, working women, old cranks, and fly chickens. He mooned over their charms, but he was of opinion that all of them, save the women of his own family, were different and mysterious. Yet he had known by instinct that Louetta Swanson could be approached. Her eyes and lips were moist, her face tapered from a broad forehead to a pointed chin, her mouth was thin but strong and avid, and between her brows were two outcurving and passionate wrinkles. She was thirty, perhaps, or younger. Gossip had never touched her, but every man naturally and instantly rose to flirtationists when he spoke to her, and every woman watched her with stilled blankness. Between games, sitting on the Davenport, Babbitt spoke to her, with the requisite gallantry, that sonorous Floral Heights gallantry, which is not flirtation, but a terrified flight from it. "'You're looking like a soda fountain tonight, Louetta.' "'Am I? Old Eddie kind of on the rampage?' "'Yes, I get so sick of it.' "'Well, when you get tired of hubby, you can run off with Uncle George.' "'If I ran away, oh, well.' "'Anybody ever tell you your hands are awful pretty?' She looked down at them, she pulled the lace of her sleeves over them, but otherwise she did not heed him. She was lost in unexpressed imaginings. Babbitt was too languid this evening to pursue his duty of being a captivating, though strictly moral, male. He ambled back to the bridge tables. He was not much thrilled when Mrs. Frink, a small twittering woman, proposed that they try to do some spiritualism and table-tipping. You know, Chum can make the spirits come. Honest, he just scares me. The ladies of the party had not emerged all evening. But now is the sex given to things of the spirit, while the men warred against base things material, they took command and cried, Oh, let's! In the dimness the men were rather solemn and foolish, but the good wives quivered and adored as they sat about the table. They laughed. Now you be good, or I'll tell. When the men took their hands in the circle, Babbitt tingled with a slight return of interest in life as Louetta Swanson's hand closed on his with quiet firmness. All of them hunched over intent. They startled as someone drew a strained breath. In the dusty light from the hall they looked unreal. They felt disembodied. Mrs. Gunch squeaked, and they jumped with unnatural jocularity, but at Frank's hiss they sank into subdued awe. Suddenly, Incredibly, they heard a knocking. They stared at Frink's half-revealed hands and found them lying still. They wiggled and pretended not to be impressed. Frink spoke with gravity. Is someone there? A thud. Is one knock to be the sign for yes? A thud. And two for no? A thud. Now, ladies and gentlemen, shall we ask the guide to put us into communication with the spirit of some great one passed over, Frank mumbled. Mrs. Orville Jones begged, Oh, let's talk to Dante. We studied him at the reading circle. You know who he was, Orby? Certainly I know who he was, the Wap poet. Where do you think I was raised? From her insulted husband. Sure, the fellow that took the cook's tour to hell. I've never waded through his poetry, but we learned him about him at the U, said Babbitt. Page, Mr. Dundee intoned Eddie Swanson. "'You ought to get him easy, Mr. Frink, you and he being fellow poets,' said Luella Swanson. "'Fellow poets, rats! Where'd you get that stuff?' protested Virgil Gunch. "'I suppose Dante showed a lot of speed for an old-timer. Not that I've actually read him, of course, but to come right down to hard facts, he wouldn't stand a one, two, three if he had to buckle down to practical literature and turn out a poem for the newspaper syndicate every day like Chum does. That's so, from Eddie Swanson. Those old birds could take their time. 
Judas Priest, I could write poetry myself if I had a whole year to do it, and just wrote about that old-fashioned junk like Donnie wrote about. Frink demanded, Hush now, I'll call him. Oh, laughing eyes, emerge forth from the, uh, the ultimate, and bring hither the spirit of Dante, that we mortals may list to his words of wisdom. You forgot to give him the address, 1558 Brimstone Avenue. Fiery Heights, hell. Grinch chuckled, but the others felt that this was irreligious. And besides, probably it was just Chum making the knocks. But still, if there did happen to be something to all this, be exciting to talk to an old fellow belonging to way back in early years. A thud. The spirit of Dante had come to the parlor of George F. Babbitt. He was, it seemed, quite ready to answer their questions. He was glad to be with them this evening. Frank spelled out the messages by running through the alphabet till the spirit interpreter knocked at the right letter. Littlefield asked in a learned tone, Do you like it in paradise, monsieur? We are very happy on the higher plane, signor. We are glad that you are studying this great truth of spiritualism, Dante replied. The circle moved with an odd creaking of stays and shirt fronts. Suppose, suppose, where there were something to this. Babbitt had a different worry. Suppose Chum Frank was really one of those spiritualists. Chum had, for a literary fellow, always seemed to be a regular guy. He belonged to the Chatham Road Presbyterian Church and went to the boosters' lunches and liked cigars and motors and racy stories. But suppose that secretly, after all, you never could tell about the darn highbrows, and to be an out-and-out spiritualist would be almost like being a socialist. No one could long be serious in the presence of Virgil Gunch. Ask Dante how Jack Shakespeare and old Verge, the guy they named after me, are getting along, and don't they wish they could get into the movie game? He blared, and instantly all was mirth. Mrs. Jones shrieked, and Eddie Swanson desired to know whether Dante didn't catch cold with nothing on but his wreath. The pleased Dante made humble answer. But Babbitt, the cursed discontent was torturing him again, and heavily, in the impersonal darkness, he pondered, I don't. We're all so flip and think we're so smart. There'd be a fellow like Dante. I wish I'd read some of his pieces. I don't suppose I ever will now. He had, without explanation, the impression of a slaggy cliff, and on it, in silhouette against menacing clouds, a lone and austere figure. He was dismayed by a sudden contempt for his surest friends. He grasped Loretta Swenson's hand and found the comfort of human warmth. Habit came, a veteran warrior, and he shook himself. What the deuce is the matter with me this evening? He patted Loretta's hand to indicate that he hadn't meant anything improper by squeezing it, and demanded a frank, See, see if you can get old Dante to spiel us some of his poetry. Talk up to him. Tell him, when a gonna senor come sava, we gets get our little poem, senor. Two. The lights were switched on. The women sat on the front of their chairs in the determined suspense, whereby a wife indicates that as soon as the present speaker was finished, she is going to remark brightly to her husband, "Well, dear, I think perhaps it's about time for us to be saying good night." For once Babbitt did not break out in blustering efforts to keep the party going. He had. There was something he wished to think out. But the physical research that started them off again. Why don't they go home? Why didn't they go home? Though he was impressed by the profundity of the statement, he was only half enthusiastic when Howard Littlefield lectured, The United States is the only nation in which the government is a moral ideal and not just a social arrangement. True, true, they weren't ever going home. He was usually delighted to have an inside view of the momentous world of motors, but tonight he scarcely listened to Eddie Swanson's revelation. If you want to go above the javelin class, the Zico is a mighty good buy. A couple of weeks ago, and mind you, this was a fair square test. They took a Zico stock touring car. 
and they slid up the town so out of hill on high and fellow told me zico's good boat but were they planning to stay all night they really were going with a flutter of ah oh, we did have the best time most aggressively friendly of all was babbitt yet as he burbled he was reflecting i got through it but for a time there i didn't hardly think i'd last out he prepared to taste the most delicate pleasure of the host making fun of his guest in the relaxation of midnight as the door closed he yawned voluptuously chest out shoulders wiggling and turned cynically to his wife she was beaming oh it was nice wasn't it i know they enjoyed every minute of it don't you think so he couldn't do it he couldn't mock it would have been like sneering at a happy child he lied ponderously you bet best party this year by a long shot wasn't the dinner good and honestly i thought the fried chicken was delicious you bet fried to the queen's taste best chicken i've tasted in for a coon's age didn't matilda fry it beautifully and don't you think the soup was simply delicious it certainly was it was corking best soup i've tasted since heck was a pup but his voice was seeping away they stood in the hall under the electric light in its square box like shade of red glass bound with nickel she stared at him why george don't sound you sound as if you hadn't really enjoyed it sure I did of course i did george what is it oh i'm kind of tired i guess been pounding pretty hard at the office need to get away and rest up a little well we're going to maine in just a few weeks now dear yeah then he was pouring it out nakedly robbed of that reticence myra i think it'd be a good thing for me to get up there early but you have this man you have to meet in new york about business what man oh sure him oh that's all off but i want to hit maine early get in a little fishing catch me a big trout by golly a nervous artificial laugh well why don't we do it verona and matilda can run the house between them and you and i can go any time if you think we can afford it but that's i've been feeling so jumpy lately i thought maybe it might be good thing if i got kind of off by myself and sweated out me george don't you want me to go along she was too wretchedly in earnest to be tragic or gloriously insulted or anything save dumpy and defenseless and flushed to the red steaminess of a boiled beet of course i do i just meant remembering that paul risling had predicted this he was as desperate as she i mean sometimes it's a good thing for an old grouch like me to go off and get it out of his system he tried to sound parental then when you and the kids arrive i figured maybe i might skip up to maine just a few days ahead of you i'd be ready for a real bat see how i mean he coaxed her with large booming sounds with affable smiles like a popular preacher blessing an easter congregation like a humorous lecturer compelling his stint of eloquence like all perpetrators of masculine wiles she stared at him the joy of festival drained from her face do i bother you when we go on vacations do i add anything to your fun he broke suddenly dreadfully he was hysterical he was a yelping baby yes yes hell yes but can't you understand i'm shot to pieces i'm all in i got to take care of myself i tell you, i got to i'm sick of everything and everybody i got to it was she who was mature and protective now why of course you shall run off by yourself why don't you get paul to go along and you boys just fish and have a good time she patted his shoulder reaching up to it while he shook with palsied helplessness and in that moment was not merely by habit fond of her but clung to her strength she cried cheerily now upstairs you go and pop into bed we'll fix it all up i'll see to the doors now skip for many minutes for many hours for a bleak eternity he lay awake shivering reduced to primitive terror comprehending that he had won freedom and wondering 
what he could do with anything so unknown and so embarrassing as freedom. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Babbitt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter Ten. No apartment house in Zenith had more resolutely experimented in condensation than the Revelstroke Arms, in which Paul and Zilla Risling had a flat. By sliding the beds into low closets, the bedrooms were converted into living rooms. The kitchens were cupboards, each containing an electric range, a copper sink, a glass refrigerator, and, very intermittently, a Balkan maid. Everything about the arms was excessively modern, and everything was compressed, except the garages. The Babbitts were calling on the Rislings at the arms. It was a speculative venture to call on the Rislings, interesting and sometimes disconcerting. Zilla was an active, strident, full-blown, high-blossom blonde. When she condescended to be good-humored, she was nervously amusing. Her comments on people were saltily satiric and penetratively of accepted hypocrisies. "'That's so,' you said, and looked sheepish. She danced wildly and called on the world to be merry, but in the midst of it she would turn indignant. She was always becoming indignant. Life was a plot against her, and she exposed it furiously. She was affable tonight. She merrily hinted that Orville Jones wore a toupee, that Mrs. T. Charmaldi Frank's singing resembled a Ford going into high, and that the Honorable Otis Diebel, mayor of Zenith and candidate for Congress, was a flatulent fool, which was quite true. The Babbitts and Riesling sat doubtfully on stone-hard brocade chairs in the small living room of the flat with its mantle unprovided with a fireplace, and its strip of heavy gilt fabric upon a glaring new player piano, till Mrs. Risling shrieked, "'Come on, let's put up some pep in it. Get out your fiddle, Paul, and I'll try to make Georgie dance decently.' The Babbitts were in earnest. They were plotting for the escape to Maine, but when Mrs. Babbitt hinted with plump smilingness, "'Does Paul get as tired after the winter's work as Georgie does?' Then Zelia remembered an injury, and when Zelia Risling remembered an injury, the world stopped till something had been done about it. "'Does he get tired? No, he doesn't get tired. He just goes crazy, that's all. You'd think Paul so reasonable. Oh, yes, and he loves to make out. He's a little lamb, but he's stubborn as a mule. Oh, if you had to live with him, you'd find out how sweet he is. He just pretends to be meek so he can have his own way. And me?' I get the credit for being a terrible old crank, but if I didn't blow up once in a while and get something started, we'd die of dry rot. He never wants to go any place, and why last evening, just because the car was out of order, and that was his fault, too, because he oughtn't to have taken it to the service station and had the battery looked at, and he didn't want to go down to the movies on the trolley. But we went, and then there was one of those impudent conductors, and Paul wouldn't do a thing. I was standing on a platform waiting for the people to let me into the car, and this beast of a conductor hollered at me. Come on, you move up. Why, I've never had anybody speak to me that way in all my life. I was so astonished, I just turned to him and said, I thought there must be some mistake. And so I said to him, perfectly pleasant, Well, are you speaking to me? And he went on and bellowed at me. Yes, I was. You're keeping the whole car from starting, he said, and then I saw he was one of those dirty, ill-bred hogs that kindness is wasted on, and so I stopped and looked right at him, and I said, I beg your pardon? I am not doing anything of the kind. I said, it's the people ahead of me who won't move up, I said, and furthermore, let me tell you, young man, that you're a low-down, foul-mouthed, impertinent skunk. I said, and you're no gentleman. I certainly intend to report you, and we'll see, I said, whether a lady is to be insulted by any drunken bum that chooses to put on a ragged uniform. And I thank you, I said, to keep your filthy abuse to yourself. And then I waited for Paul to show that he was half a man and come to my defense. And he just stood there and pretended he hadn't heard a word. 
and so I said to him, Well, I said, Ah, oh, cut it, cut it, Zill. Paul groaned, We all know I'm Molly Coddle and you're a tender bud. And let's let it go at that. Let it go? Zilia's face was wrinkled like the Medusa. Her voice was a dagger of corroded brass. She was full of the joy of righteousness and bad temper. She was a crusader, and like every crusader, she exulted in the opportunity to be vicious in the name of virtue. Let it go! If people knew how many things I've let go! Oh, quit being such a bully. Yes, a fine figure you'd cut if I didn't bully you. You'd lie in bed till noon and play your idiotic fiddle till midnight. You're born lazy, and you're born shiftless, and you were born cowardly, Paul Riesling. Oh, now don't say that, Zilia. You don't mean a word of it, protested Mrs. Babbitt. I will say that, and I mean every last word of it. Oh, now, Zilia, the idea. Mrs. Babbitt was maternal and fussy. She was no older than Zilla, but it, she seemed so at first. She was placid and puffy and mature, whereas Zilla, at forty-five, was so bleached and tight-corseted that you knew only that she was older than she looked. The idea of talking to poor Paul like that. Poor Paul is right. We're both poor. We'd be in the poorhouse if I didn't jazz him up. Why, now, Zilla, Georgie and I were just saying how hard Paul's been working all year. And we were thinking it would be lovely if the boys could run off by themselves. I've been coaxing George to go up to Maine ahead of the rest of us and get the tired out of his system before we come. And I think it would be lovely if Paul could manage to get away and join him. At this exposure of his plot to escape, Paul was startled out of impassivity. He rubbed his fingers. His hands twitched. Celia Braid. Yes, you're lucky. You can let George go and not have to watch him. Fat old George never peeps at another woman. Hasn't got the spunk. The hell I haven't. Babbitt was fervently defending his priceless immorality. When Paul interrupted him, and Paul looked dangerous, he rose quickly. He said to Zelia, I suppose you imply I have a lot of sweethearts. Yes, I do. Well, then, my dear, since you ask for it, there hasn't been a time in the last ten years why I haven't found some nice little girl to comfort me, and as long as you continue your amiability, I shall probably continue to deceive you. It isn't hard. You're so stupid. Zilla glabbered, she howled. Words could not be distinguished in her slaver of abuse. Then the bland George F. Babbitt was transformed. If Paul was dangerous, if Zilla was a snake-locked fury, if the neat emotions suitable to the revel-slake arms had been slashed into raw hatreds, it was Babbitt who was the most formidable. He leaped up. He seemed very large. He seized the other's shoulder. The cautions of the broker were wiped from his face, and his voice was cruel. "'I've had enough of this damn nonsense. I've known you for twenty-five years, Zill. And I never knew you to miss a chance to take your disappointments out on Paul. You're not wicked. You're worse. You're a fool. And let me tell you that Paul is the finest boy God ever made. Every decent person is sick and tired of your taking advantage of being a woman and springing every mean innuendo you can think of. Who the hell are you that a person like Paul should have to ask your permission to go with me. You act like you were a combination of Queen Victoria and Cleopatra. You fool. Can't you see how people snicker at you and sneer at you? Scylla was sobbing. I've never, I've never, I've, I've never been talked like this done all my life. No, but that's the way they talk behind your back always. They say you're a scolding woman, oh, by God. That cowardly attack broke her. Her eyes were blank. She wept. But Babbitt glared stolidly. He felt that he was the all-powerful official in charge, and that Paul and Mrs. Babbitt looked on him with awe, that he alone could handle this case. Still arrived, she begged. Oh, they don't. They certainly do. I've been a bad woman. I'm terribly sorry. I'll kill myself. I'll do anything. Oh, I'll... what do you want? She abased herself completely. Also, 
She enjoyed it. To the connoisseur of scenes, nothing is more enjoyable than a thorough melodramatic, egotistic humility. I want you to let Paul beat it off to Maine with me, Babbitt demanded. How can I help his going? You've just said I was an idiot and nobody paid any attention to me. Oh, you can help it, all right, all right. What you got to do is cut out hinting that the minute he gets out of your sight, he'll go chasing after some petticoat. Matter of fact, that's the way you start the boy off wrong. You ought to have more sense. Oh, I will. Honestly, I will, George. I know I was bad. Well, forgive me. All of you forgive me. She enjoyed it. So did Babbitt. He condemned magnificently and forgave piously. And he went parading out with his wife. He was grandly explanatory to her. Kind of a shame to bully Zilla, but of course it was the only way to handle her. Gosh, I certainly did have her crawling. She said calmly, Yes, you were horrid. You were showing off. You were having a lovely time thinking what a great fine person you were. Well, by golly, can you beat it? Of course I might have expected you to not stand by me. I might have expected you'd stick up for your own sex. Yes, poor Zelia, she's so unhappy. She takes it out on Paul. She hasn't a single thing to do in that little flat, and she broods too much, and she used to be so pretty and gay, and she resents losing it, and you were just as nasty and as mean as could be. I'm not a bit proud of you, or of Paul, boasting about his horrid love affairs. He was sulkily silent. He maintained his bad temper at a high level of outraged nobility. All the four blocks home. At the door, he left her, in self-approving haughtiness, and tramped the lawn. With a shock, it was revealed to him. Gosh, I wonder if she was right, if she was partially right. Overwork must have flayed him to abnormal sensitiveness. It was one of the few times in his life when he had queried his eternal excellence and he perceived the summer night, smell the wet grass. Then, I don't care. I've pulled it off. We're going to have our spree, and for Paul, I'd do anything. 2. They were buying their main tackle at Ijams Brothers, the sporting goods mart, with the help of Willis Ijams, fellow member of the Booster Club. Babbitt was completely mad. He trumpeted and danced. He muttered to Paul, Say, this is pretty good, eh? to be buying the stuff, eh? And good old Willis Ijams himself coming down to on the floor to wait on us. Hey, if those fellows that are getting their kit for the North Lakes knew we were clear up in Maine, they'd have a fit, eh? Well, come on, Brother Ijam, Willis, I mean. Here's your chance. We're a couple of easy marks. Whoo, uh, let me at it. I'm going to buy out the store. He gloated on fly rods and gorgeous rubber hip boots, on tents with celluloid windows, and folding chairs and ice boxes. He simple-heartedly wanted to buy all of them. It was the Paul whom he was vaguely protecting who kept him from his drunken desires. But even Paul lightened when Willis Ijams, a salesman with poetry and diplomacy, discussed flies. Now, of course, you boys know, he said, the great scrap is between dry flies and wet flies. Personally, I'm for dry flies. More sporting. That's so. A lot more sporting, fulminated Babbitt, who knew very little about flies, either wet or dry. Now, if you'll take my advice, George, you'll stock up well on these pale evening dims and silver sedges. And red ants, oh boy, there's a fly, that red ant. You bet, that's what it is, a fly, rejoiced Babbitt. Yes, sir, that red ant, said Ijams, is a real honest to god fly oh i guess old mr trout won't come a hustlin then i drop one of the red ants on the water asserted babbitt and his thick wrist made a rapturous motion of casting yes and the landlocked salmon will take it too said ijams who had never seen a landlocked salmon salmon trout say paul can you see uncle george with his khaki pants on haulin em in some morn about seven Whee! Three. They were on the New York Express, incredibly bound for Maine, incredibly without their families. They were free, in a man's world, in the smoking compartment of the Pullman. Outside of the car window was a glaze of darkness. 
dipped with the gold of infrequent mysterious lights. Babbitt was immensely conscious, in a sway and authoritative clatter of the train, of going, of going on. Leaning toward Paul, he grunted, Gosh, pretty nice to be hiking, eh? The small room with its walls of ochre-colored steel was filled mostly with the sort of men he classified as the best fellows you'll ever meet, real good mixers. There were four of them on the long seat, a fat man with a shrewd fat face, a knife-edged man in a green velour hat, a very young man with an imitation amber cigarette holder, and Babbitt facing them. On two movable leather chairs were Paul and a lanky old-fashioned man, very cunning with wrinkles bracketing his mouth. They all read newspapers or trade journals, boot and shoe journals, crockery journals, and waited for the joys of conversation. It was the very young man, now making his first journey by Pullman, who began it. "'Say, gee, I had a wild time in Zenith,' he gloried. "'Say, if a fellow knows the ropes there, he can have as wild a time as he can in New York.' "'Yeah, bet you simply raised the old Ned. I figured you were a bad man when I saw you get on the train.' chuckled the fat one. The others delightedly laid down their papers. "'Well, that's all right. Guess i seen some things in the arbor you never seen,' complained the boy. "'Oh, I'll bet you did. I bet you lapped up the malted milk like a regular little devil.' Then the boy, having served as introduction, they ignored him and charged into real talk. Only Paul, sitting by himself, reading at a serial story in a newspaper, failed to join them and all but Babbitt regarded him as a snob, an eccentric, a person of no spirit. Which of them said which has never been determined, it does not matter, since they all had the same ideas and expressed them always with the same ponderous and brassy assurance. If it was not Babbitt who was delivering any given verdict, at least he was beaming on the Chancellor who did deliver it. And that, though, announced the first, they're selling quite some booze in Zenith. Guess they are everywhere. I don't know how you fellows feel about prohibition, but the way it strikes me is that it's a mighty beneficial thing for the poor sob that hasn't got any willpower, but for fellows like us, it's an infringement of personal liberty. That's a fact. Congress has got no right to interfere with a fellow's personal liberty, contended the second. A man came in from the car, but as all the seats were filled, he stood up, while he smoked his cigarette. He was an outsider. He was not one of the old families of the smoking compartment. They looked upon him bleakly, and after trying to appear at ease by examining his chin in the mirror, he gave up and went out in silence. "'Just been making a trip through the South. Business condition is not very good down there,' said one of the council. "'Good fact. Not very good, eh?' "'No, it didn't strike me they were up to normal.' Not up to normal, eh? No, I wouldn't hardly say they were. The whole council nodded sagely and decided, Yep, not hardly up to snuff. Well, business conditions ain't what they ought to be out west, neither. Not by a long shot. That's a fact, and I guess the hotel business feels it. That's one good thing, though. These hotels, they've been charging five bucks a day, yes, and maybe six, seven. Or run room or going darn good to get four and maybe give you a little service that's a fact well it's been about hotels i hit that st francis and san francisco for the first time the other day and say it certainly is a first-class place you're right brother the st francis is a swell place absolutely a one that's a fact i'm right with you it's a first-class place yeah, but say, any of you fellows ever stay at the uh, Rippleton in Chicago? I don't want to knock. I believe in boosting whenever you can, but say, of all the rotten dumps that pass themselves off as first-class hotel, that's the worst. I'm going to get those guys one of these days, and I told them so. You know how I am? Well, maybe you don't know, but I'm accustomed to first-class accommodations, and I'm perfectly willing to pay a reasonable price. I get into Chicago late the other night, and Rippleton's near the station. I'd never been there before, but I says to the taxi drivers, always believe in taking a taxi when you get in late. May cost a little more money, but gosh, it's worth it when you got to be up early next morning and out selling a lot of crabs. 
and I said to him, Oh, just drive me over to the Riffleton. Well, we got there, and I breezed up to the desk and says to the clerk, Well, brother, got a nice room with bath for Cousin Bill? Say, you'd have thought I'd sold him a second or, or ask him to work on Yom Kipper. He hands me the cold-boiled stare and yaps, I don't know, friend, I'll see. And he ducks behind the rim of a jig. They keep track of the rooms on. Well, I guess he called up the Credit Association and American Security Lurg to see if I was all right. He certainly took long enough, or maybe he just went to sleep. But finally, he comes out and looks at me like it hurts him. and croaks, I ain't think I can let you have a room and bath. Well, that's awful nice of you. Sorry to trouble you. How much you'll send me back, I says real sweet. It'll cost you seven bucks a day, friend, he says. Well, it was late, and anyway, it went down on my expense account. Gosh, if I'd been paying it instead of the firm, I'd be trampling the streets all night before I'd be a let a hick tavern slick me seven, eight big round dollars, believe me. So I let it go at that. Well, the clerk wakes a nice young bellhop, fine lad, not a day over seventy-nine years old. Fought at the Battle of Gettysburg and doesn't know it's over yet. Thought I was one of the Confederates, I guess, from the way he looked at me. And Rip Van Winkle took me up to something. I found out afterwards they called it a room. But first I thought there had been some mistake. I thought they were putting me in the Salvation Army collection box at seven per each and every diem. Gosh. Yeah, I heard of the Rippleton was pretty cheesy. Now, when I went to Chicago, I always stay at the Blackstone or La Salle, first-class places. Say, any of you fellows ever stay at uh, Birchdale at Terre Haute? How is it? Oh, uh, Birchdale, first-class hotel. Twelve minutes of conference on the state of hotels in South Bend, Flint, Dayton, Tulsa, Wichita, Fort Worth, Winona, Erie, Fargo, and Moose Jaw. Speaking about prices, the man in the Lavura had observed, fingering the elk tooth on his heavy watch chain, I'd like to know where they get this stuff about clothes coming down. Now you take this suit I got on. He pinched the trouser leg. Four years ago, paid forty-two fifty for it, and it was real sure enough value. Well, here the other day I went into a store back home and asked to see a suit, and the fellow yanks out some hand-me-downs that honest. I wouldn't put on a hired man. Just out of curiosity, ask him, what you charge for that junk? Junk, he says. What do you mean, junk? That's a swell piece of goods, all wool. Like hell. It was nice vegetable wool right off the old plantation. It's all wool, says, and we get sixty-seven ninety for it. Oh, you do, do you? I says. Not for me, you don't. I says. I walks right out on him. You bet. I says to the wife. Well, I said, as long as your strength holds out and you can go on putting a few more patches on Papa's pants, We'll just pass up buying clothes. That's right, brother. And just look at collars, for instance. Hey, wait, fat man protested. What's the matter with collars? I'm selling collars. You realize the cost of labor on a collar is 207% above? They voted that if their old friend the fat man sold collars, then the price of collars was exactly what it should be. But all other clothing was tragically too expensive. They admired and loved one another now. They went profoundly into the science of business and indicated that the purpose of manufacturing a plow or a brick was so that it might be sold. To them, the romantic hero was no longer the knight, the wandering poet, the cowpuncher, the aviator, nor the brave young district attorney, but the great sales manager, who had an analysis of merchandising problems on his glass-top desk, whose title of nobility was Go-Getter and who devoted himself and all his young samurai to the cosmic purpose of selling, not of selling anything in particular, for to be anybody in particular, but pure selling. The shop talk roused Paul Reelsing. Though he was a player of violins and an interestingly unhappy husband, he was also a very able salesman of tar roofing. He listened to the fat man's remarks on the value of house organs and bulletins, as a method of jabbing up the boys on the road, and he himself offered one or two excellent thoughts on the use of two-cent stamps on circulars. Then he committed an offense against the holy law of the clan of good fellows. He became highbrow. They were entering a city 
On the outskirts they passed a steel mill, which flared in scarlet and orange flame, but licked at the cadaverous stacks, at the iron-sheathed walls and sullen converters. "'My Lord, look at that! Beautiful!' said Paul. "'You bet it's beautiful, friend. That's the Shelling Horton steel plant. And they tell me old John Shelling made a good three million bones out of munitions during the war. The man with the velour hat said reverently, I didn't mean it. I mean it's lovely the way the light pulls that picturesque yard, all littered with junk right out of the darkness, said Paul. He stared at him, while Babbitt crowed, Paul, there has certainly got to one of the great little eye for picturesque places and quaint sights and all that stuff been an author or something if he hadn't gone into the roofing line paul looked annoyed babbitt sometimes wondered if paul appreciated his loyal boosting the man in the velour hat grunted well personally i think shelling horton kept their works awfully dirty bum routing but i don't suppose there's any law against calling them picturesque if it gets you that way Paul sulkily returned to his newspaper, and the conversation logically moved on to trains. "'What time we get into Pittsburgh?' asked Babbitt. "'Pittsburgh? I think we get in a—no, that was last year's sketch. Wait a minute. Let's see. Got a timetable right here. One or four on time.' "'Yeah, sure. We must be about on time.' "'No, we aren't. We are seven minutes late. Last station.' "'We were? Straight? My gosh, I thought we were right on time.' No, we're about seven minutes late. Yep, that's right, seven minutes late. The porter entered, a negro in white jacket with brass buttons. How late are we, George? growled the fat man. Indeed, I don't know, sir. I think about on time, said the porter, folding towels and deftly tossing them up on the rack above the washbowls. The council stared at him gloomily, and when he was gone, they wailed. I don't know what's come over these niggers nowadays. They never give you a civil answer. That's a fact. They're getting so they don't have a single bit of respect for you. The old-fashioned coon was a fine old cuss. He knew his place. But these young dingies don't want to be porters or cotton pickers. Oh, no. They got to be lawyers, professors, and Lord knows what all. I'll tell you, it's becoming a pretty serious problem. We ought to get together and show the black man yes and the yellow man his place. Now, I haven't got one particle of race prejudice. I'm the first one to be glad when a nigger succeeds. So long as he stays where he belongs and doesn't try to usurp the rightful authority and business ability of the white man. That's the... Uh, and another thing we got to do, said the man with the velour hat, whose name was Koplinsky, is to keep those damn foreigners out of the country. Thank the Lord they're putting a limit on immigration. Those dagoes and hunkies... I've got a lot to learn. This is a white man's country, and they ain't wanted here. When we've assimilated the foreigners, we got here now and learned them the principles of Americanism and turned them into regular folks. Well, maybe we'll let in a few more. You bet. That's a fact, they observed, and passed on to lighter topics. They rapidly reviewed motor car prices, tire mileage, oil stocks, fishing, and the prospects for the wheat crop in Dakota. But the fat man was impatient at this waste of time. He was a veteran traveler and free of illusions. Already he had asserted that he was an old he-one. He leaned forward, gathered in all their attention by his expression of sly humor, and grumbled, "Ah, oh, hell, boys, let's cut out the formality and get down to the stories. They became very lively and intimate. Paul and the boy vanished. The others slid forward on the long seat, unbuttoned their vests, thrust their feet up on the chairs, pulled the stately brass cuspidors nearer, and ran the green window shade down on its little trolley to shut them from the uncomfortable strangeness of night. After each bark of laughter, they cried, Hey, did you ever hear the one about? Babbitt was expansive and virile. When the train stopped at an important station, the four men walked up and down the cement platform, under the vast, smoky train shed roof like a stormy sky under the elevated footways, beside crates of ducks and sides of beef, in the mystery of an unknown city. They strolled abreast, old friends and well content. At the long drawn, all aboard! Like a mountain call at dusk, they hastened back into the smoking compartment, and, till two in the morning, continued to droll tales, their eyes damp with cigar smoke and laughter. 
When they parted, they shook hands and chuckled. Well, sir, it's been a great session. Sorry to bust it up. Mighty glad to meet you. Babbitt lay awake in the close, hot tomb of his Pullman berth, shaking with remembrance of the fat man's limerick about the lady who wished to be wild. He raised the shade. He lay with a puffy arm tucked between his head and the skimpy pillow, looking out on the sliding silhouettes of trees and village lamps like exclamation points. He was very happy. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of Babbitt》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter Eleven. One. They had four hours in New York between trains. The one thing Babbitt wished to see was the Pennsylvania Hotel, which had been built since his last visit. He stared up at it, muttering, "Twenty-two hundred rooms and twenty-two hundred baths." That's got everything in the world beat. Lord, their turnover must be, well, suppose price of rooms is forty-eight dollars a day, and I suppose maybe some ten, and four times twenty-two hundred, say six times twenty-two hundred. Well, anyway, with restaurants and everything, say summers between eight and fifteen thousand a day, every day. I never thought I'd see a thing like that. Some town. Of course, the average fellow in Zenith has got more individual initiative than the four flushers here, but I got to hand it to New York. Yes, sir, town, you're all right. Some ways, well, old Paulinski, I guess we've seen everything that's worth while. How we kill the rest of the time, movie? But Paul desired to see a liner. I always wanted to go to Europe, and by thunder, I will too some day before I passed out. He sighed. From a rough wharf on the North River they started to the stern of the Antiqua, and her stacks and wireless antenna lifted above the dock house, which shut her in. "'By golly!' Babbitt droned. "'Wouldn't it be so bad to go over to the old country and take a squint at all those ruins and the place where Shakespeare was born, and think of being able to order a drink whenever you wanted one? Just range up to a bar and holler out loud. Give me a cocktail. Darn the police. Not bad at all. What'd you like to see over there, Paulibus? Paul did not answer. Babbitt turned. Paul was standing with clenched fist, head drooping, staring at the liner as in terror. His thin body, seen against the summer glaring planks of the wharf, was childishly meager. Again, what would you hit for on the other side, Paul? Scowling at the steamer, his breast heaving, Paul whispered, "'Oh, my God!' While Babbitt watched him anxiously, he snapped, "'Come on, let's get out of this!' and hastened down the wharf, not looking back. Oh, "'That's funny,' considered Babbitt. "'Boy didn't care for seeing the ocean boats after all. I thought he'd be interested in them, too.' Though he exulted and made sage speculations about locomotive horsepower, as their train climbed the main mountain ridge, and from the summit he looked down the shining way among the pines, though he remarked, Well, oh, by golly, when he discovered that the station at Katakumchuk, the end of the line, was an aged freight car. Babbitt's moment of impassioned release came when they sat on a tiny wharf on Lake Sanskoham, awaiting the launch from the hotel. A raft had floated down the lake, between the logs and the shore. The water was transparent, thin-looking, flashing with minnows. A guide in black felt hat with trout flies in the band and flannel shirt of a peculiarly daring blue sat on a log and whittled and was silent. A dog, a good country dog, black and woolly, gray, a dog rich in leisure and in meditation, scratched and grunted and slept. The thick sunlight was lavish on the bright water, on the rim of gold-green balsam boughs, the silver birches and tropic ferns, and across the lake it burned on the sturdy shoulders of the mountains. Over everything was a holy peace. Silent, they loafed on the edge of the wharf, swinging their legs above the water. The immense tenderness of the place sank into Babbitt, and he murmured, I'd just like to sit here the rest of my life and whittle, and sit, 
and never hear a typewriter, or Stan Graff fussing on the phone, or Roan and Ted scrapping. Just sit. Gosh! He patted Paul's shoulder. How does it strike, you old snoozer? Oh, it's darn good, Georgie. There's something sort of eternal about it. For once, Babbitt understood him. 3. The launch rounded the bend at the head of the lake. Under a mountain slope they saw the little central dining shack, their hotel, and the crescent of squat log cottages which served as bedrooms. They landed and endured the critical examination of the habituates, who had been at the hotel for a whole week. In their cottage, with its high stone fireplace, they hastened, as Babbitt expressed it, to get some regular he-togs. They came out, Paul in an old gray suit and soft white shirt, Babbitt in khaki shirt and vast, and flapping khaki trousers. It was excessively new khaki, his rimless spectacles belonged to a city office, and his face was not tanned but a city pink. He made a discordant noise in the place, but with infinite satisfaction he slapped his legs and crowed, Say, this is getting back home, eh? They stood on the wharf before the hotel. He winked at Paul and drew from his back pocket a plug of chewing tobacco, a vulgarism forbidden in the Babbitt home. He took a chew, beaming and wagging his head as he tugged at it. Mm, um, maybe I haven't been hungry for a wad of eating tobacco. Have some. They looked at each other in a grin of understanding. Paul took the plug, gnawed at it. They stood quiet, their jaws working. They solemnly spat, one after the other, into the placid water. They stretched voluptuously, with lifted arms and arched backs. From beyond the mountains came the shuffling sound of a far-off train. A trout leaped and fell back in a silver circle. They sighed together. 4. They had a week before their families came. Each evening they planned to get up early and fish before breakfast. Each morning they lay abed till the breakfast bell, pleasantly conscious that there was no efficient wives to rouse them. The mornings were cold, the fire was kindly as they dressed. Paul was distressingly clean, but Babbitt reveled in a good sound dirtiness in not having to shave till his spirit was moved to it. He treasured every grease spot and fish scale on his new khaki trousers. All morning they fished unenergetically, or tramped the dim and aqueous lighted trails along the rank ferns, and moss sprinkled with crimson bells. They slept all afternoon, and till midnight played stud poker with the guides. Poker was a serious business to the guides. They did not gossip, they shuffled the thick, greasy cards with a deft ferocity, menacing to the sports, and Joe Paradise, king of the guides, was sarcastic to loiterers, who halted the game even to scratch. At midnight, as Paul and he blundered to their cottage over the pungent wet grass and pine roots confusing in the darkness, Babbitt rejoiced that he did not have to explain to his wife where he had been all evening. They did not talk much. The nervous loquacity an opinionation of the Zenith Athletic Club dropped from them. But when they did talk, they slipped into the naive intimacy of college days. Once they drew their canoe up to the bank of the Susquehann water, a stream walled by the dense green of Hardhack. The sun roared on the green jungle, but the shade was sleepy peace, and the water was golden and rippling. Babbitt drew his hand through the cool flood, and mused, we never thought we'd come to Maine together. No, we never done anything the way we thought we would. I expected to live in Germany with my granddad's people and study the fiddle. That's so. Remember how I wanted to be a lawyer, go into politics? I still think I might have made a go at it. I kind of got the gift of gab. Anyway, I can think on my feet and make some kind of a spiel on most anything. And, of course, that's the thing you need in politics, by golly. Ted's going to law school, even if I didn't. Well, I guess it's worked out all right. Myra's been a fine wife, and Zilla means well, Polybus. Yes, up here. I figure out all sorts of plans to keep her amused. I kind of feel like life is going to be different. Now that we're getting good rest and can go back and start over again. 
I hope so, old boy. Shyly. Say, gosh, it's been awful nice to sit around and loaf and gamble and act regular with you along, you old horse thief. Well, you know what it means to me, Georgie. Saved my life. The shame of emotion overpowered them. They cursed a little to prove they were good, rough fellows. And in a mellow silence, Babbitt whistling while Paul hummed, they paddled back to the hotel. Five. Though it was Paul who seemed overwrought, Babbitt who had been the protecting big brother, Paul became clear-eyed and merry while Babbitt sank into irritability. He uncovered layer on layer of hidden weariness. At first, he had played nimble jester to Paul, and, for him, sought amusements. By the end of the week, Paul was nurse, and Babbitt accepted favors with the condescension. One always shows a patient nurse. The day before the families arrived, the women guests at the hotel bubbled. Oh, isn't it nice? You must be so excited. The proprietress compelled Babbitt and Paul to look excited, but they went to bed early and grumpy. When Myra appeared, she said at once, Now we want you boys to go on playing around just as if we weren't here. The first evening he stayed out for poker with the guides, and she said in placid merriment, My, you're a regular bad one. The second evening she groaned sleepily, Good heavens, are you going to be out every single night? The third evening he didn't play poker. He was tired now in every cell. Funny. Vacation doesn't seem to have done me a bit of good, he lamented. Paul's frisky as a colt, but I swear I'm crankier and nervouser than when I came up here. He had three weeks in Maine. At the end of the second week, he began to feel calm and interested in life. He planned an expedition to climb Shaham Mountain and wanted to camp overnight at Boxcar Pond. He was curiously weak yet cheerful, as though he had cleansed his veins of poisonous energy and was filling them with wholesome blood. He ceased to be irritated by Ted's infatuation with a waitress, his seventh tragic affair this year. He played catch with Ted, and with pride taught him to cast a fly in the pine-shadowed silence of Scumwet Pond. And at the end, he sighed, Hang it! I'm just beginning to enjoy my vacation, but, well, I feel a lot better, and it's going to be one great year. Maybe the real estate board will elect me president instead of some fuzzy old-fashioned faker like Chan Mott. On the way home, whenever he went into the smoking compartment, he felt guilty at deserting his wife and angry at being expected to feel guilty. But each time he triumphed. Oh, this is going to be a great year, a great old year. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Babbitt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti. MikeVendetti.com. Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter Twelve. One. All the way home from Maine, Babbitt was certain that he was a changed man. He was converted to serenity. He was going to cease worrying about business. He was going to have more interests: theaters, public affairs, reading. And suddenly, as he finished an especially heavy cigar, he was going to stop smoking. He invented a new and perfect method. He would buy no tobacco. He would depend on borrowing it. And, of course, he would be ashamed to borrow often. In a spasm of righteousness, he flung his cigar case out of the smoking compartment window. He went back and was kind to his wife about nothing in particular. He admired his own purity and decided, absolutely simple, just a matter of willpower. He started a magazine serial about a scientific detective. Ten miles on, he was conscious that he desired to smoke. He ducked his head like a turtle, going into its shell. He appeared uneasy. He skipped two pages in his story and didn't know it. Five miles later, he leaped up and sought the porter. Say, uh, George, have you got a... The porter looked patient. We got a timetable. Babbitt finished. At the next stop, he went out and bought a cigar. Since it was to be his last before he reached Zenith, he finished it down to an inch stub. 
Four days later, he again remembered that he had stopped smoking, but he was too busy catching up with his office work to keep it remembered. Two. Baseball, he determined, would be an excellent hobby. No sense a man working his fool head off. I'm going out to the game three times a week. Besides, Phil ought to support the home team. He did go and support the team, and enhanced the glory of Zenith by yelling, Atta boy, and rotten. He performed the rites scrupulously. He wore a cotton handkerchief about his collar. He became sweaty. He opened his mouth in a wide, loose grin and drank lemon soda out of a bottle. He went to the game three times a week, for one week. Then he compromised by unwatching the Advocate's timed bulletin board. He stood in the thickest and steamiest of the crowd, and as the boy up on the lofty platform recorded the achievements of Big Bill Bostwick, the picture, Babbitt remarked to complete strangers, "'Pretty nice. Good work.' and hastened back to the office. He honestly believed that he loved baseball. It is true that he hadn't, in twenty-five years, himself played any baseball except backlot catch with Ted, very gentle and strictly limited to ten minutes. But the game was a custom of his clan, and it gave outlet for the homicidal and sides-taking instincts which Babbitt called patriotism and love of sport. As he approached the office, he walked faster and faster, muttering, "'Just better hustle.' All about him the city was hustling, for hustling's sake. Men and motors were hustling to pass one another in the hustling traffic. Men were hustling to catch trolleys, with another trolley a minute behind, and to leap from trolleys, to gallop across the sidewalk, to hurl themselves into buildings, into hustling express elevators. Men in dairy lunches were hustling to gulp down the food, which cooks had hustled to fry. Men in barber shops were snapping. Just shave me once over. Got to hustle. Men were feverishly getting rid of visitors in offices adorned with signs, This is my busy day. And the Lord created the world in six days. You can spiel all you got to say in six minutes. Men who had made five thousand year before last and ten thousand last year were urging on nerve-yelping bodies and parched brains so they might make twenty thousand this year and the men who had broken down immediately after making their twenty thousand dollars were hustling to catch trains to hustle through the vacations which the hustling doctors had ordered among them babbitt hustled back to his office to sit down with nothing much to do except see that the staff looked as though they were hustling three every saturday afternoon he hustled out to his country club and hustled through nine holes of golf as a rest after the week's hustle in Zenith, it was as necessary for a successful man to belong to a country club as it was to wear a linen collar. Babbitt's was the Outing Golf and Country Club, a pleasant, gray-shingled building with a broad porch on a daisy-starred cliff above Lake Kennepoos. There was another, the Tonawata Country Club, to which belonged Charles McEverly, Horace Updike, and the other rich men who lunched not at the athletic club but at the Union Club, Babbitt explained with frequency, "'You couldn't hire me to join the Tonawanda, even if I did have a hundred and eighty bucks to throw away on the initiation fee. At the outing, you've got a bunch of real human fellows and the finest lot of little women in town, just as good at joshing as the men. But at the Tonawanda, there's nothing but these would-bees in New York get-ups drinking tea. Too much dog altogether.' Why, well, I wouldn't join the Tonawana even if they... I wouldn't join it on a bet. When he played four or five holes, he relaxed a bit. His tobacco-fluttering heart beat more normally, and his voice slowed to the drawling of his hundred generations of peasant ancestors. 4. At least once a week, Mr. and Mrs. Babbitt and Tinka went to the movies. Their favorite motion picture was The Chateau which had three thousand spectators and had an orchestra of fifty pieces which played arrangements from the operas and suites portraying a day on the farm or a four-alarm fire in the stone rotunda decorated with crown embroidered velvet chairs and almost medieval tapestries parakeets sat on gilded lattos columns with exclamations of whoa by golly and you got to go some to beat this dump 
Babbitt admired the chateau. As he stared across the thousands of heads, a gray plain in the dimness, as he smelled good clothes and mild perfume and chewing gum, he felt as when he had first seen a mountain and realized how very, very much earth and rock there was in it. He liked three kinds of film. Pretty bathing girls with bare legs, policemen or cowboys, and an industrious shooting of revolvers, and funny fat men who ate spaghetti. He chuckled with immense moist-eyed sentimentality at interludes portraying puppies, kittens, and chubby babies, and he wept at deathbeds and old mothers being patient in mortgage cottages. Mrs. Babbitt preferred the pictures in which handsome young women in elaborate frocks moved through sets ticketed as the drawing-rooms of New York millionaires. As for Tinka, she preferred, or was believed to prefer, whatever her parents told her to. All his relaxations, baseball, golf, movies, bridge, motoring, long talks with Paul at the athletic club, or at the good red beef and old English chop-house, were necessary to Babbitt, for he was entering a year of such activity as he had never known. End of chapter 12